We have two workflows. The first one is obviously the 3D workflow. And the most important thing that we need to watch out is the proportions. So basically, object sizes should be proportional to real world. For example, the bottle I have in this scene is about 20 or 25 centimeters high. Next step, I want to show you how you can scale your objects to real world. I have the final version of the model, but the thing is that it is incredibly large. For example, if I add in a default cube, you can see that how huge that puddle is because the default cube is 2 meters high. So what you can do is, you can select that cube, go to the object properties and change its Y size to something reasonable like 20 or 25 centimeters. So I will type in 25, hit enter, then I will select the bottle, go to the say front view and scale that puddle down until it fits into that cube. It doesn't have to be really exact. Something rough will be more than enough. Now we can delete that cube and we can start to work on that adjusted puddle. The second important thing in the 3D workflow is probably the UVs. You should have really proper and accurate UVs so that you don't have trouble texturing the objects in, say, Photoshop. For example, that part of the bottle has a very clean UV layout which will make things a lot easier when it comes to texturing. As you can see, the UV layout is quite simple and easy to understand and follow. And I could say the same thing for the bottom part. So make sure that you have proper and accurate UVs before getting into the texturing process. The second workflow is texturing and the most important thing in this process is image quality or image depth. So make sure that you are working in 16 bits or 32 bits. 32 might be overkill, so I usually create my textures in 16 bits, but never create your textures in 8 bits. This is the worst thing that you can do, so eliminate that option. So basically, whenever you are creating textures, firstly, go to the mod and set this to 16. Also, image size plays an important role. For example, the texture I have here is 4K. So the resolution should be as high as possible. You should also note that the displacement is happening in a small portion of that resolution. So we are not using every pixel of the 4K resolution. You should always keep that in mind. So for that reason, try to keep your resolution as high as possible. Now let me show you what I have in this file. At the bottom, I have that UV layout coming from the Cinema 4D. I also, before exporting the texture out, I highlighted that area so that I can know where to place that text. That text element has a little bit blur in it. If you skip that part, if you remove that blur, the render will look a bit, uh, you know, sharp. So make sure that you add in a little bit blur. And below that, I have the background and at the top, I have that invert adjustment layer. The reason why I added in that layer is because, you know, the black is zero, the white is one. So which means that the white parts of the texture will be calculated as displacements, if that makes sense. And finally, you export the textures. I usually export the textures as PSD, which makes things a bit easier to adjust because, you know, I can always go back to the Photoshop and adjust things, save the file, and I can go back to Cinema 4D. It is going to increase the file size, but I believe it is worth it. In this texture, I want to show you a nice tip because when you have multiple layers, it is quite challenging to blur everything. So what I do is hit Ctrl A to select all, then hit Ctrl Shift and C. Then I hit Ctrl V. This is going to screenshot the whole thing and paste it over. And this is going to enable us to blur the whole texture. Like I can go to the filter, open up the blur and add in some blur, like, I don't know, 5%. And finally, I have that invert adjustment at the top. And this is basically it. In Cinema 4D, I will delete everything related to displacement so that we can start from zero. First thing first, let's delete those redshift object tags. Now I will find the proper materials. So I will select the bottle and then I will click on the material of it so that I can find it in the material manager. Then I will double click on the material in the material managers to open up the node editor. Let me find the things that are related to displacements. 
I will basically delete those guys. Also, this one is connected to the color layer. So after deleting those ones, I should delete the, I mean, disable the layer one. Okay, nothing is related to displacement in this material. So I will just close it, then find the other material. I will select object first, find the material of it, then open up the node editor. I will simply delete these ones. Now we can start from zero. By the way, Redshift IPR is enabled. Now let me go back to the first material, this one, the material of the bottle, then open up the node editor one more time. And the first node I am going to add in is a displacement node. So I will type in displacement. I will bring this one in. Then I will look for another node. It is going to be a texture node. I will add this one in. Then I will select the texture node Then click on the folder icon and select the texture that I prepared in Photoshop. I will double click on this one. Then I will link the texture to the displacement. And finally, I will link the displacement, to the displacement aspect of the output node and not the material. In fact, you are not going to find anything related to displacement in the material node. So let's link the displacement to the displacement. Give it a few seconds to refresh. And here we have the first result. But as you can see, it doesn't look good or right. And the reason being, we don't have enough resolution on the bottle. If I increase up the real geometry, it is going to slow things down. This is for sure. So let's keep it at maybe two. And instead of the subdivision surface, let's try to subdivide the mesh with a redshift tag. So I will right click, come down to render tags and click on redshift object tag. I will go to the geometry, enable overwrite, enable tessellation, and finally enable the displacement. Let's give it a few seconds to refresh the render. Well, it cannot do that. Maybe we should refresh the IPR. Yeah, now it looks better, but it is not perfect. If you look at those parts closely, you will see those jagged edges. I don't know the reason why, but the result from the IPR and result from the render view don't match at all. So from this point on, I will be using the Redshift render view. So let's turn this off and open up the render view. I will hit render. And as you can see now, the displacement is looking really smooth and nice. We don't have that problem, those jagged edges. By the way, let me show you my render settings. Actually, I haven't changed anything significant. I just, I believe, lowered down the progress of passes so that it doesn't render forever. So that's it basically with the render settings. Now I want to open up that material because I want to make some adjustments to the displacement node. So as I mentioned in the texturing process, the white parts of this texture will be calculated as one, as displacement. So this is why the text is pointing out. But if I go to the displacement and to reverse the scale, like to minus one, I will get that look. And this is something that I am looking after. The scale might be too much though, so let's try 0.3, minus 0.3. Yeah, that looks a bit better, but you can adjust this to your liking. As you can see, it is quite simple and straightforward. All you need is a displacement node, and then you just need to play around with the scale amount. Now let's turn this off and open up the other material. I will open that up. I will again add in a displacement node, then a texture node. I will select the second texture then I will link this to the displacement and finally I will link the displacement node to the displacement aspect of the output. We are having the same problem again. The object doesn't have enough resolution so what I'm going to do is just select the tag, hold on control and duplicate it to the last object. Okay, it looks better but it is not perfect. And the reason why it is not perfect is because the scale of the displacement. So I will 
find the material, go to the displacement, and change the scale to something low. You should remember that this object is smaller than, than the model itself, so we need to go lower than what we did with the first displacement. Even that amount is too much, so I will set this to 0 0.05. Maybe 0 0.03. Perfect. I will close this one and go back to the first material because I will show you one last thing about what you can do with those displacement maps. So I have this color layer over here and I can use this texture to mask out the bottom section of the displacement. So what I'm going to do is firstly select the color layer. This is linked to the color of the material. I will skip layer one. I will enable the layer two. But the thing is that I want to have that black color only on the bottom part of the displacement. So to do that, I will enable the layer two again. Then I will link the texture, the displacement texture to the layer two mask. It is going to be that simple. We can adjust the color, like we can set this to something lighter. You should remember that this is only affecting the color, it is not going to change the way the material looks. We can do that as well by creating a second material and use the same texture as a masking element. Finally, I will show you one more thing if you are having trouble with the displacement. If you remember the first feedback, we got really jagged edges in the IPR view. So if you are still having that problem, what you need to do is select the object tag of the object and then lower down the minimum edge length. This is going to obviously increase up the render time, but if you are having this kind of problems, this is what you need to do. You may think that the whole displacement thing may slow down the process, but once the subdivision is calculated, it is incredibly fast. Like I can select the bottle and I can rotate that around and I will I will see an instant feedback in the render view. And finally to render the final image what you need to do is make the final adjustments. We can go back to the camera and enable the bouquet. And we can pick up a focus point like here and then we can click on the bucket rendering because right now it is what it is doing is progressive rendering. And it is limited to what I said in the settings of the Redshift 128. So to see the final result, we should enable the bucket rendering. Once the render is done, we can send this image to picture view. We can click on this icon. And now we can finally save the image as we just need to click on this icon. Before wrapping up the tutorial, I shall say that you can apply the same workflow to bump maps. So this is going to be it for this tutorial. If you have any questions, just let me know anytime and I will see you the next time. Bye.